Okay. Hello, everybody. This is the Kudan Open Lab Seminar, Cultural Data Analytics, um, on um, March 14, 2022. And um, it's our greatest pleasure to uh, host the ICE Lab uh, in Umea, Sweden, today as our lab encounter guests. And uh, so one of the uh, things which I, and this is the only thing I want to say before that, um, that I want to mention is that this is actually part of an informal series. So there is some strategy to, to all this. Um, we had before a lab encounter with uh, the Digital Humanities Society of Estonia. We had another one with the Digital Humanities crowd in Helsinki. We had another uh, lab encounter with the Computational Social Science crowd in Copenhagen and uh, another one with the Net Network Science crowd in Helsinki. And so we're working our way around the Baltic Sea, where later in the semester we will also have the Cultural Evolution crowd from Stockholm. Uh, but today we, uh, in some sense, um, um, welcome a lab which uh, I personally feel super, super excited. Obviously, I'm excited about all of them, but in this case, I'm particularly excited because you have a very, very broad approach uh, to multidisciplinary science that uh, not only covers a spectrum of disciplines, but also the full spectrum of sort of, you know, very theoretical math, you may say, um, and uh, theory, and on the other hand, very applied uh, biology. And there is plenty of things which, even though you may not be known for being, uh, you know, a, a center for doing cultural research, there is an amazing amount of methods that are super relevant to us and firmly convinced. And today we're gonna to learn about mapping network flows, tools and applications. And um, as I said, I don't wanna go much more into detail. Um, the PI, Martin Roswell, I'm gonna give the word to you. You will talk about uh, the ICE Lab and the introduction to mapping network flows with Infonet. Um, which is also an introduction into the approach you have to uh, sort of most radical, most broad interdisciplinary science, if I'm rightly informed. Stay Thank seat. you very much. Yeah, the, this uh, I, I really like the, this idea. Um, when I when I realized what it is about, and uh, not only giving a talk, but also having the labs meeting and uh, exchanging ideas. It's very much in the spirit of IceLab and uh, an idea we would like to steal. Yes, so uh, today uh, from uh, my group, you will see uh, Daniel, Jelena, Chris, Anton, and, and I. Uh, I will give an, op an opening about uh, who we are in ICE Lab and then zoom in on into our research group and present a little bit, uh, as Max mentioned, about what, when we say mapping network flows, what do we mean and, and why do we do it? And then uh, Anton, Chris, Jelena, and Daniel in order will present some um, tools and applications. And uh, these are rough estimates of the times, and uh, we encourage interruptions. So um, whenever you have a question, stop us. And uh, they could lead to a 10 minute discussion in the middle of a talk, and that's fine. Um, so we, I mean, we just, we just go and see where, where uh, how it will take place. Yes. So first about the um, Integrated Science Lab or ICE Lab, we call it ICE Lab. So here we have uh, broken uh, ice sheets um, and as like a, a symbol of uh, different disciplines who uh, free, uh, refreeze and then uh, break apart uh, in, a, like a, in this dynamic landscape of science. And um, I'm one of... Five PIs. I, I, um, when I came back after my postdoc in the US to Umeå, uh, Integrated Science Lab did not exist, but I had been in an interdisciplinary lab in Copenhagen um, at the Niels Bohr Institute, and I had been in a very unusual theoretical biology lab in uh, Seattle at the University of Washington, where everyone was welcome and uh, it was a wet lab, but the only 
equipment we had there was a coffee machine and it and good beans and it attracted a lot of uh, smart people and uh, with many different ideas so it was really a um, a place where people gathered um, from many different sciences and i and i felt like okay i want to do something like this when i grew up and and uh, i was happy to have the opportunity to form ice lab together together with other researchers uh, one of them uh, peter holme who is now who was in umeå at that time and has been in japan and now coming to finland um, and also part of the network science community so um this is some of the peoples uh, max mentioned the mentioned the breath the breadth so the pis come from uh, math and ecology and physics and we have a lot of collaboration with public health molecular biology um and uh, it's a it's a it's a young crowd we um we fill the space mainly with the uh, postdocs and phd students and um uh, we work on on different uh topics but mathematical mathematical modeling is somehow the things that glue us together um, yes and um what do we do what, what's somehow the what's our mission so uh, at the university and outside the university we we have this uh we, we like new idea and and uh, like how do you come up with new ideas well one good algorithm is to combine two existing ideas so typically those ideas are hosted by people so here this is uh, sarah and peter as an example sarah is um, a modeler and peter is uh, an experimentalist and they are working on um, well overlapping interests say um, antibacterial resistance or something and uh, they move um, in this uh, space of the unknown which, which we call science and their paths overlap but they are unaware of each other um, so this is a like a lost opportunity uh, what if Sarah could have used uh, Peter's experiments and Peter could have used Sarah's modeling skills um, then they wouldn't have missed this target which was uh, maybe something really important so this is where we uh, uh, this is just an example uh, to, to put some modeling on this so Sarah takes 12 months to make an experiment and six months to model and analyze the data so she's a better modeler and Peter is the opposite. So typically a, a project involves both. So that will take a certain amount of time. Uh, but if uh, Sarah could specialize on her thing and uh, collaborate with uh, and only do that, she would be faster for two projects. And if they collaborate, they, they complete uh, more science in shorter time and they can um, hopefully unite their path through through science and discover new things somehow this is the essence of what we want to do in in ice lab and uh, what we do in practice is um, um, like uh, we have ice lab camps or so, uh, if you have uh, young researchers master student phd student postdocs who are interested in interdisciplinary science we organize every fall a camp where we train students who have trained uh, for many many years to answer questions and help them ask questions which is uh, perhaps the most important skill researcher must uh, acquire and and it's we don't learn this in school uh, so it's really a, a crash course in how to to uh, do multidisciplinary science and um, to, 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 to intervene uh, i am a little bit worried that the the, the, the procedure you explained on the previous slide when everybody specializes in his own thing is probably faster but it gives less experience to the people because your uh, Sarah is always analyzing data, your Peter is always uh, 
doing experiment and they do not learn new things. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, presentation. Yeah, this this is only half. This is like the uh, speed benefit. But I agree that this is not if 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 it, if we were machines and only specialized, uh, this wouldn't work. You need to, and that's why we have ice lab. We yeah, sit yeah, together. Exactly. I mean, I prob probably the, 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 the next slide answers that because, because all this Ex uh, exactly uh, in terms of uh, hackathons and, and uh, camps and everything. It's sort of yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, exactly. It's really yeah. about. Uh, having people meet and collaborate and I, I will make i will do one example because the latest thing we did was this ice lab hackathon uh, in a way all these things are different versions of a hackathon but then we finally called something a hackathon um, and it works like this so the idea is that you have half an idea we many of us walk around with half ideas it's like I have this brilliant stuff, uh, but I can't do it because, and then we have different reasons. It could be that you, you have a tool, but you have, no, don't have a question or the opposite. You have a question, but you don't have the tool. You have the data, but you don't know how to analyze it. And somehow the end goal of a, a researcher is to publish a paper because then you tell a story about new knowledge. Um, so uh, this is how it works. This is the long path we take. Uh, uh, we write research proposals uh, and so on and that's that's what i'm doing right now uh, to fund our activities um but we wanted to speed up this a little bit so and we wanted people to meet so we um we organized these pitches it was unfortunately an online event this fall uh, the idea is to gather a big crowd and then have uh, short pitches uh, powerful pitches with open questions so you come in with i have this really cool data um and this question but i don't know how to get from i don't know how to uh, analyze it or the, the other way around and then you try to um basically make ideas meet and mate people connect and so we had a second stage where, where you develop these ideas so we invited participants to a hackathon at a remote place where they could work for three days without interruptions or uh, the noise from day-to-day -day university do this. And um, so uh, a couple of these ideas we developed further. Um, and then we have a program um, with, um, yeah, so this was open interactive. It's really about, you know, brainstorming. Whereas this was more focused, really write the embryo of a proposal. Uh, with people you haven't met before. So, so getting to know each other uh, and that stuff you missed in the first slide. And then uh, we have, so, so if you have this proposal, this idea, what typically happens if, is that you depart. Uh, you need something that keeps you together. And our approach right now is to provide postdocs. So we have a postdoc program, so you could apply it to ICE Lab, um, and uh, you have basically two PIs or two researchers. You want uh, good things to come out uh, of their collaboration, and this postdoc is the glue that keeps them together and the projects running forward. So this is one way, one approach we uh, we take, and then they they sit here. So we have. Um, yeah, so last round we had from uh, COVID modeling and um, uh, river network modeling and antibiotic resistance modeling. And uh, so that's that. Now let's zoom in a little bit. So then now this uh, we come to uh, my re like the, the group I'm leading. And so today you will meet Anton, Daniel, and Chris, all PhD students. And uh, you will also meet, uh, let's see where we have Jelena. Where are you, Jelena? There. Jelena is a postdoc in Ice Lab. 
And uh, I think Alexis, you're here too. Alexis just finished his, his postdoc and is now in Helsinki, but he's joined this uh, uh, meeting and uh, we're still, still collaborating. Yes, so uh, the way it works, like we, got, we get interested in different problems and uh, we may get interested in new problems after the meeting today. So we have we are working on some disease modeling. We are working on biodiversity. We are working on like science itself, and uh, we have some uh, financial stuff. We are also working on um, uh, how plants respond to stress. It's a it's a big project in the group, and and the common thing uh, with these questions is that there is some network, there is some relational data, and the the clues to understand these problems uh, lies in the analyzing these networks. So a typical approach is that we, we come in with the research question. So how can we explain natural phenomena X? So for example, Alexis came to our group, um, like being uh, first starting with collecting fossils, then analyzing during his P PhD, the, the pattern of, uh, uh, he uh, he has, has collected in the fossil data and got interested in networks and wanted to do work with those who developed the methods. And he came to IceLab and we have had four uh, fantastic years together. Uh, so the, what, where it started was that he used the methods we had developed already. So it's like, okay, you have that problem, let's do this method. Uh, but then we realized that it has some limitations for this particular problem. So we need a new method B. Uh, and then we can apply that to his question or someone else's question. But then I, I, with- I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm afraid I missed what the question exactly is. Okay, he has fossils and what, what is the question about them? Well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, that was just, an, um, uh, ha yeah, I happened to take that example because out. Alexis showed up. So he's interested in uh, macro evolution. So how can we describe what has happened during the last 500 million years uh, as life has developed? Maybe, maybe Alexis, you can step in and, and uh, summarize in 30 seconds what you're interested in. Sure, uh, I would say that the idea was to understand the large scale, large scale structure of uh, marine diversity in the last 500 million years, how, how diversity is organized. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna send this in, thank you. Yeah. And what's the network? <laughs> Similarity or, or, or is it uh, um, phylogeny? It's just it's it species, species occurrences. Sorry? Species occurrences. Species occurrences. Uh, thank you. Very good. Uh, yeah, so this like answering this leads to new questions and that uh, means that we, we try the same method, it doesn't work, we need to go to method C. Uh, and it continues like this. And we develop, it's like um, experiments and um, or new data and new methods step leapfrog forward. Um, so like summarizing what we do in the lab is that we explore the structure dynamics and function of various systems, social, biological, technological, ecological, and financial. And we develop what we call maps. Like the, they are simplified descriptions of these systems. And um, we also show some tools because once you have done this, um, we, we have learned that having a method that just solves a problem and spits out some uh, result data isn't enough. We need visualizations to interpret those results. Uh, so we develop those as well. And uh, Anton will show some examples. And uh, typically this um, like method A, B, C, and so on uh, involves using refined network representations. So you start with like, Let's represent these relational data with an undirected, unweighted network. 
And then uh, you realize that you throw away a lot of information. So what if we could uh, include that information instead in a richer representation? And we'll say something about that. And then you have all the problems with, okay, we don't have complete data, you have missing observations, and Jelena will talk about how we deal with that. So uh, why, why do we talk about uh, mapping and, and maps of uh, networks? So uh, it's, it's because we are inspired about uh, from like how, how we use maps to navigate the world. So this is um, a satellite image of our planet. Uh, it contains a lot of information, but it's pretty useless to navigate between uh, Umeå and Tallinn. So instead, we use uh, Google Maps. And uh, how do I get from Umeå to Tallinn? Well, we, we use, uh, and, and now the question is, uh, wh where is Umeå? For you, where is Umeå? So here you see Umeå as uh, in northern, northern Sweden. And if you come and visit, you're, you want to know where's the university. Uh, in relation to the airport. Here's the airport, here's the university, and where am I? Well, I sit in ice lab and I can use uh, this, um, uh, this more detailed zoom in map and say that I'm, I'm sitting here. And it would be pretty useless if I pointed here and say I'm sitting in this building here, uh, even though the information is there if I zoomed in. Um, so this is like why maps are so great because we can, we can use them to navigate, we can zoom in, in and zoom out and explore. And uh, the, the thing is with, with maps, we have, we've been making maps for thousands of years. So it was more of an engineering problem to develop Google Maps once we had the good satellite data. Whereas for networks, it's, it's somehow the opposite. That uh, we had a lot of data, but we didn't have the math or the methods to turn large networks into something that we could explore in a simple way. So here's an example with network scientists connected if they have co-authored a paper. And, and th these are from the methods we've developed. So for this toy network where uh, a module here or a community represents a topic in network science. And if you zoom in, you have research groups and if you zoom in, you have individual researchers in the research group. So this is what we are going to talk about today. Like, how do you, how do you understand the, the mess in this hairball? Uh, so I'm, I'm just, uh, now, now I'm uh, out of time, but I'm, I'm going to uh, just give you a hint of, of how the math works. And then uh, Anton will show you some tools you can use if you're interested. We have tried to remove uh, as many obstacles as possible so that you can play. Um, and um, we are interested in uh, flows. Uh, like you've heard about stochastic block models probably. Uh, a shout out if you haven't, but if you wanna, if you have a network and you wanna model uh, how how um, some maybe how have not. say it again. Some maybe have not heard. Okay, and I, I, I just uh, so we go back to this uh, hairball. Uh, so this hairball has some structure. It turns out, and we found it uh, with our method here. Uh, a common approach is to uh, try to identify groups. Uh, a group is the, um, uh, has, in a group, nodes have similar properties. For example, they uh, link to the same other nodes. And uh, one model, one uh, mathematical model or statistical model for this is the so-called statistical block model. So you're searching for blocks. And a block is a set of nodes uh, with similar properties, how they link to other nodes. And often they, they link to themselves a lot. So that, that, that's what you would see in a social network. Uh, a block will consist of nodes linking a lot within that group and much less to other nodes. Um, 
And when you take this approach, you're interested in how the network was formed. So you have a model that generates network and generate links. Um, but then once that network exists there and you go out and measure, you're also interested in what's the function? How, how does this, the pattern that we see, uh, how does that affect the function of the system, whatever function that is? And then uh, that's why we are interested in flows on the networks. Because the, the, we, we think about the links as constraints of how information or energy or something else can move on the network. Um, so we want a little model of this. Uh, we, we, um, even if you have a limited number of friends, you can get information from many more people because your friends have friends. And a way to capture that is to have models of flows on the network. Uh, yes, to, please. Just to clarify, uh, am I right to understand that your problem is you have already a given network and you study the flows only, or is it the opposite way around? You know the flows and you want to reconstruct the network? Uh, uh, most often, they're like 99% of the time, the first. <laughs> okay. Yes. And, and sometimes you don't even have to flow, but you, you let stuff flow on the network to understand the structure of the network. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so what you, can, you can think about this as like streets connected to other streets, and you are making a random walk. You're walking from street to street. Uh, and um, exploring a city. And then because of the, the structure of the city, there will be places where you get stuck, where you spend a longer time. So uh, if this was a biological network, it could be uh, signaling pathways. You're, you're basically um, discovering signaling pathways where you have a function of the biological system. But here it would be neighborhoods. Uh, if it's a street discrete, network. Uh, continuous time random walk or discrete time random walk? We do both, <laughs> depending on the problem. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, will, I will illustrate with a uh, discrete. So that, <laughs> then what we want to do, so we, this is, uh, I formulated this as networks describe where flows, flows move to depending on where they are. That's really the, like mathematically what a network does. You have nodes. So I know a flow can sit on a node and then you have links and those links are the opportunities where you can go if you are at the node. Um, and what maps do is that they depict regularities using less information. It's that they simplify. They simplify and highlight important structure. Um, so it's easier for me to talk about uh, this map and this network. Uh, here I can say that, well, you have this neighborhood, this neighborhood, this neighborhood, and this neighborhood, and there, there is some flow between. And uh, here you have a, a lot of flow, and here you have little flow. And so the, the challenge is really to go from this. Imagine that you, don't, you have not 25 nodes, but you have a million nodes. And, and uh, instead of 30 links, you have uh, 50 million uh, links. And it's going to be a giant hairball. And you need, really need this map uh, that can, you can zoom into like we do with uh, Google Maps. And, and so we turn to compression or information theory to, to solve this problem. And so this is like the, the method or the core uh, machinery in one slide, because we are all familiar with images and, and how they work. Uh, so this is a picture of uh, Umeå University, our campus, with uh, this monument called Northern Lights. And we have, we, I'm really happy, we have a guest from uh, Copenhagen. I think he's, uh, he may be in this uh, meeting. And he's been waiting for uh, uh, watching the Northern Lights. And this weekend we have the perfect Northern Lights here. Um, anyway, so um, this, uh, this is a TIFF image. And TIFF is uh, uncompressed. You, you basically describe pixel by pixel. So in the data file, you have the first pixel, this color, and then you have 16 bits or 32 bits. 
describing what uh, color it is, and then you do the next, and then do the next, and do the next. So in total, this image is 11.6 uh, six megabytes big in TIFF. But then I compress it. I use uh, a simple uh, compression algorithm called lempel C uh, compression, and uh, I managed to compress the upper part to 0.91 megabytes and the bottom part to 2.8 megabytes. So now my question to you is, uh, why? Why is it that I managed to compress the top part better than the bottom part? With the same algorithm. Yeah. yeah. Well, clearly because there is just blue sky over there and lots of detail, details in the mode. Exactly. More, more regularities in the, in the top part. And the compression algorithm can exploit this structure. So uh, this, we we uh, when when we compress images, we are interested in how succinctly can we describe the the data. We want to fit as much as possible on our hard drives, uh, and we don't care so much about what regularities the algorithm finds, but we use the same math, but we are we don't care so much about how much data do we need to store the network, but we are interested in what regularities can we find. And there is this duality in information theory between finding regularities and compressing the data that describe those regularities. So the better we can compress it, the more regularities we can find. And you, you, you can't. Um, you can't compress data uh, without finding regularities, unless it's lossy compression. Compression. We talk about non-lossy compression here. Yeah, the only way to compress data is to find regularities. And uh, so this this uh, number, which we have uh, on our uh, image files, is actually a measure of how good we are at finding regularities. And applied to uh, our network science problem, uh, we have a network. We release a random walker that explores this network. And we put code words on the nodes in a clever way so that nodes visited often have short code words. And those that are visited uh, less often have long code words. So now I have mapped this. Uh, visual problem of uh, having a random walker on a network into a coding problem because now I have a code for this exactly this walk uh, that I can I can I can communi communicate this uh, walk to you just by sending you these bits and the code book that maps codes to nodes and obviously this is not I'm not going to use this code uh, to communicate this network to you because uh, we, we don't uh, think in binary alphabets. Uh, but it, it helps us measure how good we are at finding regularities. So now, instead of using a single codebook, I can introduce multiple codebooks. Uh, think about in the old times when we had area codes for phone numbers. Like I, I grew up with a five digit phone number uh, it wouldn't be impossible to have five digit digital digit phone numbers in Sweden for everyone, unique, uh, because we are 10 million people, but we have these area codes and we make most phone calls within our uh, area. And that's why it's efficient. And this is somehow a similar idea. So once the random walker enters a region here, it will use these short code words that are unique for this module. And then when you leave it, you pay a price, you, you use your uh, area code. Um, and, and here are the, the codes for entering different colors and for leaving them. Uh, and then, so you can see that we can, re we can reuse code words. Here is 111 and here's 111. We can uh, use short code words uh, in many places. And then um, it's a trade-off. If you use super small modules, many super sm small modules, uh, you can have short code words within them, but then you transition a lot between them, and that's going to cost. And this is the other extreme where you have only one uh, community. You have no transition between modules to pay for, but you must have long code words within. 
Uh, so it's an optimization problem. I can uh, I can give you a hint of what it looks like. Uh, here we have. Um, we have this random walker walking on this network with the code words. Um, uh, it just happens to be a slightly different code words in this case, but they are also uniquely decodable. And then you can you can see here if we only have one code book that's like one community describing everything. We need so far 4.7 bits to describe movements on this network. But if we uh, partition it. <laughs> Uh, into smaller modules. This is the optimal solution. We are down to uh, 3.7 bits. So this is this is our currency. This is what we measure, uh, and and we try to minimize this by by testing different uh, partitions partitions. So, uh, I'm sorry. I'm rather uh, confused about what sort of problem we are actually solving. Uh, I mean, uh, question number one, uh, do, do we consider the uh, uh, large time limit uh, sort of distribution of, 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 of the random walk? What sort of property of a random walk are you interested in? Uh, that's number one. That number two, is your network uh, directed or indirected it was indirected until now but now it's suddenly directed and uh, yeah, yeah. number three this uh, this guy on, on the screen it jumps along the uh, 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 somehow in, in, in from, from place to place sometimes where there is no link how to understand that yes i take them in reverse order uh... <laughs> So in a previous slide, yeah, you saw us, you saw me listing a lot of different network types. Sometimes undirected, unweighted is enough. Sometimes you need weights. Sometimes you need directions. So now we have directions. So, uh, this. Uh, the question is basically motivated by the fact that obviously in, in the long time limit on the, on the non-directed network, you have uniform, you have uniform distribution. Let, let him explain. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. No. All right, so this, uh, I, I think we, we should, uh, we, we can, we can leave these uh, things for, uh, for, la for later, but um, every, like, you have a, you have a, you have a, the fundamental problem is you have a large network and you don't understand what's going on. You want to simplify it. And you want to understand how different processes, how the way the network is form and shaped affect different processes on the network. Uh, you pick a random walker as a model because the random walker is the simplest possible model, a minimal number of assumptions. You get an idea about uh, how things move, how things flow on the network and where things can get stuck. And um, then it's up to you to decide what does it mean that the random worker gets stuck in certain regions. And uh, you have decided to, in this case, represent it with a directed network. A directed network has some uh, advantages, but also some uh, challenges. One is that if you look at this node, it has no out incoming link. Uh, so if you run a random worker on this one, it would never enter it, the standard random worker. So we introduced teleportation. Sometimes this random walker restarts at the random place. That's when it turns red. In that way, you can have a, a mathematically well-defined steady state distribution. It doesn't matter where you start. And do you, do you so uh, as we understand, the uh, walker is random, but um, obviously the jump is something, do you ar arbitrarily decide every, you know, on average, there's a 10% probability that I jump randomly somewhere, like in PageRank, or or how do you do that? Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. Now we, we go into detail. So that so you can do this in um, um, simple ways and uh, more advanced ways. And uh, this is the simplest way. The simplest way is just to with the 15% chance, which is what PageRank 
Green and Page decided Page Rank should do, mm -hmm. um, and that has become a standard. Um, you jump, so it's like you take six steps and then you jump on average. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Yelena will describe a method where we, instead of using teleportation as a necessary evil to find a steady state distribution, use it to our advantage to deal with incomplete information. So she will define um, a different, different probabilities for uh, departing from each node and also for, for arriving at different nodes. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, she will show all the benefits of that. But, so that, uh, it comes later. Yes. I think I, I move on and then remember yes, if, if there was some uh, more question, uh, we take them later. We should also probably like more complicated questions sort of maybe hold back to the end because we have a gradient of people going on um, who are very technical and very not. Yeah, technical. So, yeah, yeah we, we, uh, exactly. And it's good to stop me at any time when things are unclear. Uh, but then we together decide that this, this is for uh, the end. Okay. Oh. So um, uh, in the end, we have, uh, if we only look at movements between uh, communities, we can, we can simplify. We don't care about the details, what goes on inside the communities. And we highlight movements between, this is what we have. It's a simplified description of this, uh, this network. And now um, to some uh, concrete applications to uh, illustrate. Uh, in many different um, problems, we ask these questions. So how many modules are present? Which nodes are members of which modules in these maps? And the approach I presented um, uses compression as uh, um, the machinery. And uh, we have some constraints. We are looking for a modular code structure. Uh, we started with, we don't more, want more than two levels. So it's like nodes and communities. And we have hard partitions, so each node can only belong to one module. And then we, we will relax this, these ones uh, later today. Mm -hmm. uh, but then basically you have, you have a network and you release the, well, you measure how, how long is the random walk. And we don't need to go to the actual codes. We can use Shannon, Claude Shannon's uh, source coding theorem and uh, write a closed form expression for this uh, and using the entropy. The Shannon entropy. So uh, what what we care about now uh, today is just think about these images. Uh, we can describe this movements on this network with one community, everyone in the same with 4.75 bits. If we divide it into three communities, uh, we describe movements between and movements within, and in total it's 3.68 bits. So here, this just tells us we pre prefer this solution over this solution because it gives higher compression. It means we have found more regularities. Is it the best solution? No, it's not. You can actually divide it into nine and further compress the description. Um, and a, an example from science. So here uh, uh, we have uh, 10 million citations between 10,000 journals. So the way we do is we, we write papers. Everyone in this meeting, we write papers and we cite each other um, and we publish in journals. So this is a journal or a proceeding um, and we cite other papers in other proceedings or journals. And uh, in this case, we forget about the details of uh, article to article citation and focus on journal to journal citations. We aggregate them. And then we can define a, a random walk. And this would be us uh, reading a paper, finding an interesting citation, uh, going to that paper and uh, keeping track of which journal we are reading. So here we have this uh, research reading journal three, four, three, one, three, and so on. It's a sequence of journals uh, as we are modeling how we navigate scholarly literature. And then uh, uh, it's a mess. Um, I mean, imagine 10,000 uh, journals, 10 million citations. 
but we use this method and we simplify in, in, into these maps where uh, if we think about a journal as the like a, a street in the world of uh, science uh, this would be like a city a city of sci science physics uh, where you spend time uh, before leaving so the size of this module is proportional to how long time you spend there so uh, science is dominated by molecular and cell biology and medicine and then uh, here this is where we many of us uh, in Iceland in, in, in my research group uh, come from computer science and physics. Um, yes. Um, I think I, uh, I, I just show you, we need to speed up a little bit. Yes, see, show you that you can do this with uh, multiple levels. So instead of having just nodes and communities, you can also use um, like super modules uh, and uh, modules sub modules within those super modules and then you can compress even further 3.48 is less than 3.57 so this is a way to uh, relax the constraints we don't not only allow it for two levels we are allow for multiple levels that allows us to reveal more regularities and compress even more so this is the same science um and uh, but now instead of just cities of science, you can see like continents of science, how science splits into life sciences, social sciences, the physical sciences, which further divides into um, math and computer science and chemistry and physics. So um, I skipped this example and um, summarize this first part by what we we want to reveal organization of network flows i presented the map equation framework for doing this and then we apply it to different uh, questions and now anton will jump in and uh, show you uh, some tools we have developed for helping you and other researchers to do this in a, in a simple way may i ask before a question I, yes maybe a question before yeah, maybe. Um, uh, the, the very, very general question. So uh, Gregory Kaitin defines compression, like shortening the description length of a problem as understanding. That, that is, was so prominent in complexity science that it even made it into the Wikipedia article of the word understanding at some point. Um, so what I find really refreshing about what you're saying or what you're laying out is basically you're defining mapping as a form of understanding which is quite contrary to uh, sort of more old school uh, notions of, uh, of science in general, where basically modeling would be the understanding. Obviously, that's also like coming up with a shorter description, <laughs> while mapping was often like rejected in funding applications as just observation or stuff like that. So, so is, I assume there's a system behind your sort of statements that uh, do, do you understand, uh, do, you, do you sort of promote mapping as a form of understanding and, and get papers accepted like this? Uh, or, or is that something? I, I think it's a very good question. I think uh, mapping is like the first step in this understanding process. You need to generate hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you can take those hypotheses and, and uh, put them in models mm -hmm. uh, for more causal understanding. Yeah, okay. And that's how I would, uh, it's a super interesting question. Uh, but you know, this like Linnaeus, what, the first thing he did to get an idea about all the diversity of, of plants um, and uh, well, species was to class, starting classifying them, organize them. And, and what we have is sort of a data-driven way to do that for networks. Yes. yes. Uh, I actually also have a short question, which is basically about uh, trying to put what you are doing is in, in, in a more general context, although from, from a different way. Uh, basically, what you're, you just described is a, some sort of community detection 
uh, algorithm, as far as I understood. Yes. And uh, well, basically, my question is well, as, as you know probably better than myself, uh, uh, there are tens of them that everybody is, in, is using kind of no human modularity, but there are ten, ten of others. And I, basically, I want to understand what is, in your opinion, the, the uh, advantage of doing it this way compared to others. Uh, maybe it is faster, maybe it's better communities by, by some sort of measure or whatever. I, I think it's uh, the, the two main uh, starting points. Like, wh why do you want to understand community? Why do you want to identify communities? And one is you're interested in how the network was formed. Then your model is a link generating process. Mm -hmm. And you use a stochastic block model to infer the underlying model. Um, so then I would then I would point you to Tiago's work and graph tool. I think it's the best approach. Um, then you have the other thing uh, which I have talked more about. You you are interested in um, okay we have this network. How does it affect the the system? What can we learn about the function of the system from the constraints of the the particular links we we see? We're not so much interested in how the network was formed, but how, the, how it shapes the dynamics. Um, then I think our approach is, uh, yeah, the, the reason why I'm still doing this 10, year, 10 years after coming up with the algorithm is I think it's the right approach. Um, because we have, instead of, Tiago has a way to, a probability distribution for generating links and we have a prob probability distribution for generating walks so so we are um equally principled but we take different um perspectives on networks and we both use information theory and compression to get to occam's razor and finding this balance between underfitting and overfitting so that they, um, yeah, we use we use similar ingredients, but think about the networks in different ways. So there is this notion of no free lunch, right? So that the yep. random walk is always best because if you always climb up the hill, you don't find valleys, and if you only go to valleys, you never find a hill. But the random walk will eventually find everything, and. That is in some sense why your method out of all the hundreds of different community finding methods ended up being one of the most central and most, most cited and uh, most elegant sort of solutions. Is that something which you find um, confirmed over and over and over again that uh, there is literally no free lunch or is there if you know domain expertise, for example, can you get around it? Is there moments when you say, oh, I, I shouldn't use my own method, I should use something different? Um, yeah, there are definitely cases when other methods are better. And, and often it's uh, Tiago's method because he's also taking this very princ principled approach. Um, and uh, we also <laughs> write in our papers that like, given the data at hand and your research question, uh you should use this method or this method so we are very um i mean it's not um it's not the method for all, pro all problems but if you're interested if if you're interested in dynamics on the network is uh i think you it's, it's a good idea to include it uh, in your analysis. Uh, uh, another thing which is which i'm concerned about uh, going back to to the question i asked, asked earlier depending on whether you use uh, continuous time or discrete time you have different statistics of random walks yeah uh, different different uh, uh, walks come up with different probabilities so it looks like your am i wrong or it looks like your algorithm should give someone different results for for completely discrete yeah time. yeah and and uh, luckily so anton will uh, talk about uh some work where we use the 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 the, the larger freedom you have with the um, continuous random works 
So, so let's let's wait with the, the answer there. You will see an application where we use continuous random workers. We, we should also like let, let it flow. <laughs> There's two people in this group that know too much about networks, so we will shut up. <laughs> yeah. So I, I leave now to Anton to show how you could, uh, even if you don't know so much about networks and analyze them, you um, and uh, coding is not your thing, you, you can uh, play with our tools anyways. Cool. Yes. So <clears throat> uh, Martin didn't mention InfoMap. So what it is, is the search algorithm for the map, map equation, optimizing the map equation. Uh, and InfoMap is written like a standalone application in C++ and we have some Python bindings, but uh, researchers can struggle to install these and we wanted to have like a low threshold way for everyone to try this out. So we have this, we have this tool called InfoMap Online, which serves as basically an interactive documentation of InfoMap. Uh, so you can try it out in your browser and, and try it on, on smaller-ish examples. And if you decide it's something for you, it's sort of the trial version, <laughs> then you can download the real deal and get the full benefits of, of uh, uh, running close to the metal. Uh, so basically, we have install instructions and all the parameters and, and uh, how you would model your, your data using networks. Uh, that's uh, in a way that the InfoMap can, can read them and support them. Uh, so. Uh, if we want to run these, we can just enter a network as a series of, of links. That's the most basic form. Uh, and we can we can run in the map on that network and we can see the output. Uh, we also have this sort of uh, toy visualization. So here is just two triangles. Uh, uh, and we, we see that the map here finds that these should be uh, expressed the two two communities and we can we can play around with this example and we can attach some more links and we can see what the result is so we just want to have one more link here and uh, add another uh, another triangle so then we get this result but if you now modify the link weights if between uh, let's say this central node and we double it uh, okay, we're still fine. We triple that link weight. Uh, so now <clears throat> the random walker would be more likely to pass uh, between these two triangles and this one would be um, merged into one single community. So this is a way to just try out uh, how the map equation works. And I also have something about the nine triangles example that Martin told you about. So uh, we can actually run this. Uh, we see the visualization and um, what we find here is it's in fact not the best solution for the map equation to put them in that sort of uh, symmetrical solution. There's actually a, a slightly more optimal way to arrange these triangles. Uh, uh, so that is to have these uh, three and these three triangles uh, organized in a hierarchical fashion. Um, and then these ones are just uh, as before. So try it on, try it on, on mapequation.org. It's available under uh, the, the code section. So another thing that we, we have developed is something called alluvial diagrams. And these are ways to look at partitions of networks and see how they differ when we have, we can have data that's uh, uh, collected in different points in time, for example, or we can have the same network that has been resampled or can be multiple reasons that we want to do this. Uh, so here I have loaded uh, three networks with uh, citations in science as Martin talked about, and these are quite old, they're like 20 years old. Uh, we can look at how the citations pattern change. Uh, so now we get this sort of top level view of these networks. Uh, so we have um, we have the live sciences here, and we have the, the physical sciences, uh, and we have uh, geophysics here. 
uh, and then we have some, I think it's control theory. Uh, computing science is not uh, represented here because we didn't include um, uh, what's it called? Uh, proceedings. So uh, we can color these by the field and we can go into each field to look at how how they look at the final level and at these different resolutions. So uh, here we see like the big shot journals, nature and science, they're organized, they're the most important subfield in the life sciences. Uh, and we can look at and track uh, neuroscience, we can look at uh, uh, oncology, for example. So if we want to look how this field develops over these years, we can have a look at that. Okay, maybe that wasn't a good example. Maybe, uh, we'll take another one. Yeah, so we can see an organizational split in the citation pattern here, where uh, some of the nodes organize together here and some go, go up in this direction. Uh, so this is one way to sort of simplify and look at the organizational structure and compare a large amount of data in a single figure. Yes, question. Yeah, basically, I wanted to well, throw in the, 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 the comment and ask you to, to respond. It sort of seems that uh, this uh, procedure sort of shows the, the disadvantage of your approach. Because we all know that nature science and NAS are not biological journals, they are multi, multidisciplinary yeah. journals. And uh, but, but your thing uh, uh, sort of absorbs them into, into life sciences because life science is the largest. Uh, uh, yes, and this uh, also is model dependent. Uh, here we didn't include, we did not include any uh, higher order effects which would have um, enabled us to, to divide citation flows that are that stay within the physical sciences or in life sciences, so we can have this overlapping solution, but uh, I didn't have something like that to show uh, right now. But uh, I, I may, I, depending on uh, uh, how, how long we discuss, I may show that. Yes. Where, where you split the, the, the big journals into multiple fields. Yes. Um, yes, so uh, basically in this tool, you can either, you can run the the standalone uh, InfoMap application and upload the results and have a look at that, or you can do as we did here and just upload a raw network and sort of run InfoMap in your browser. And yes, and I forgot to mention that both in this uh, application and InfoMap Online, it's not a web service that takes your data and uploads it to us. Uh, it's, it's entirely encapsulated inside your web browser. So there is no. Um, we, we can spy on you. That, that's basically it. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I think that's tools. And um, let's move on to the paper. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, very long title, uh, Metadata Informed Community Detection with Lazy Encoding Using Absorbing Random Walks. So what this is about is uh, modifying a random walker uh, to not uh, care about uh, nodes for each steps. It should be sensitive to sort of the attributes of the node that it's visiting and the previous nodes. Uh, and this enables us, us to model uh, different uh, system types, as, such as assortative and disassortative relationships. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one one way where this might come up is you have some commuting behavior that you want to model. Um, so you can model the commuters as just a random walk of people on an entire commuting graph and everyone just moves randomly and they would tend to uh, get stuck in certain parts of the city. And you will call, uh, you will see that the commuting flow in those parts are sort of where uh, you can use that as a proxy for uh, how uh, 
like information, ideas travel, or uh, where disease might be likely to spread, or some other thing. So we have this commuting graph, and we might release a random walker on this network and, and let it run. And then uh, the problem here is that this is not a very good model for how real people travel on, on a commuting network. It really, it really depends on where you start. So if you come from this uh, poor neighborhood, you would, not, you would be likely to travel to similar areas as where you start. Or uh, if you come from a rich neighborhood, you will probably pass through possibly poor areas and end up to another rich area. And these are the non-local relations that you cannot capture with an ordinary run and walk where you can just visit any node that's um, um, adjacent to where you are. So uh, the metadata might be uncorrelated with the network structure, and we want to look at the non-local relations. So we also sort of want a mix. We just we can just cluster the metadata, and that that's our result. But then we just disregard all of the network structure. So we want to somehow additively mix the network structure and the metadata. Uh, and we cannot really do this now because uh, the stochastic block models, they, they don't benefit from this if the, the um, metadata isn't aligned with the pairwise correlations. Uh, and also uh, previous work on doing this just divided the community structure further when we added metadata information. We couldn't sort of move continuously from metadata to structure. Uh, but we can model this in a nice way uh, using these uh, uh, lazy encoding random walks. So we use these random walks that remembers where they start. So not just the previous node, but where they, the original node where they started. And we say that every node has some associated metadata and we say that there's a probability that the random walk is absorbed at a, at a node. This depends on the starting point metadata and where the metadata on the currently visited node. And we introduce a baseline absorption probability that allows us to tune this and go from structure to metadata in a continuous manner. So, so, so the work, uh, uh, the, 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 the work works, works around not feeling the metadata, only absorbs the coding to metadata. Uh, sorry, can you repeat that, repeat that again? Uh, uh, the walker moves uh, uh, regardless of metadata, but only absorbs uh, according to metadata. Exactly. Okay. Uh, yes, I think we can uh, skip this slide. Martin has already introduced that. So uh, we start by looking at categorical absorption probability. So uh, you might have the categories just uh, rich, poor, or uh, income class one, two, three, uh, like quartiles, or uh, yeah, some, something like that. So using this uh, absorption probability xij, the probability to be absorbed at uh, i when we start at j, uh, we can express it like this, and we can model different uh, relations that we want to capture. Uh, absor assortative, neutral, or disassortative absorption. Um, if we want to model commuting behavior, we're, we're looking at assortative uh, absorption. But uh, another case for disassortative is that we want to capture the almost like a bipartite structure in a graph, for example. Then we want to look at what's the what's the other type that we want, or like multipartite. Uh, structure we can look at. So this is a modeling and, choice. And, and the network is indirect. Uh, yes, it's not direct. It can, it can, it can be direct. It can be directed as well. Well, but, but if it is directed, then then then, uh, uh, then st structure is not relevant uh, in, the P, in the small PD, I think. Because, for example, you can you can have nodes which which are unreachable. 
Ah oh, yes, uh, we assume that the, the yes, that, that's uh, very true. Uh, an assumption in this, of course, is that you can reach the nodes uh, at all. That, that, that uh, if you have a disconnected graph, then then uh, that that's a, a problem for sure. But then then the structure just says that these two are not apart at all. So it might be a good choice to have them separated. Oh, we, we go on. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, this is a, like a simple toy example, how you go from uh, neutral to absorptive absorption. So in A, we have uh, neutral. We, we, we don't care about the metadata at all. So random walker starts at, at, uh, at capital A here and encodes every step. It's like, doesn't really matter. And the, the found community structure in this example will be uh, blue and orange. And here's uh, one realization of a random walker where the, the, the probability to encode is slightly lower if the uh, metadata differs. So here we might have a chance to encode here, but uh, and also this node is completely surrounded by different type nodes, so it would likely end up in this uh, part of the, uh, the in this community, even though it is the wrong type. Uh, and if we go here from D, we're not very likely to encode here, but we're likely to somehow end up here from uh, orange or from a circled node, so we will have this division. And if we decrease the, the absorption probability even further, then we can actually move through the other types for a long time and never encode on a different type. So then we'll pick up the sort of, uh, we'll pick out the, the node metadata or attributes directly. Yes. So in a small synthetic example, uh, we have these uh, three clicks um, and we have uh, three metadata classes where we have the squares, circles, and, and triangles. And we can see here for uh, neutral absorption, we will just get the clicks. Um, uh, if we uh, decrease the parameters P and C to go to more assortative absorption, and, and um, or I should also explain that these, these links are the, um, the links that we end up with when we have realized the random walks. So it's sort of the flow graph that's resulting from this, this uh, random walk. Um, and finally, when we decrease the probability to, to encode the random walk, uh, if the metadata classes differ by a lot, then we would just end up with the metadata class. So may I ask a question? So this yes. I think is a, is, a, is a picture which I think can build a bridge to, to uh, you know, sort of cultural science, cultural history, cultural analytics more general. But what is quite interesting, you could imagine, you could interpret, uh, you know, your solution B as, you know, there's three major cities, say, uh, in Europe, London, Paris, Berlin for artists, right? And so that makes perfect sense. In all of these cities, there's different kinds of stuff going on. And the other extreme solution is to say, okay, uh, there's a community of architects, a community of painters, and a community of, I don't know, um, dancers in Berlin, London, and Paris that spread out across these three cities, but they probably have more to do with each other metadata-wise. Like I say, all architects belong together. So both of these things make sense. And then the middle solution sort of gives you sort of like Berlin architects, Paris architects, London architects. So what I'm after is in some sense, the desirable result is neither B, C or D, but uh, B, C, um, D with a Boolean or, like all of that together sort of makes the most sense and gives you a characterization of the system. How do you deal with that? So it's not a threshold uh, problem, but you want to actually sort of like present that as a whole. That is probably um, not that easy and simple to describe, isn't it? Does it make any sense what I said? 
Yeah, last connection. Uh, Did we lose Anton? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, uh, too difficult question. <laughs> 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 no, I think uh, I, very interesting um, question. Um, maybe. I mean, with some multi-layer approach, you could uh, uh, do something like that. You could model, model it at, at once. Uh, I'm not sure what you would learn, but it's worth exploring. Yeah. I can give you a classic example. There is this contentious discussion about national art, right? Is there a thing like French art, Italian art versus German art? Uh, this has been instrumentalized towards nationalism and uh, even genocide in the 20th century. And so, um, right, so people looking down at France and vice versa. And so basically that is sort of a kind of question where, you know, we may ask, is this a real category? Does this, can, can this be sort of something we can legitimize or is there different other ways how to look at it? But you get to, I think, confusion because you already hinted to it. And we just let you go on because um, I think we should sort of like have more discussion at the end so everybody gets their voice heard. I think it's probably important. Uh, sorry, I, I was disconnected. Uh, should I continue? Yes, I think I can continue from here. Uh, from this slide. Okay, so yeah. uh, I don't know what you heard, but this is uh, a map of the income classes. Um, uh, this is the resulting communities when we only look at network structure, and here we only look at uh, income classes. And here's the mix of income class and uh, uh, and underlying um, network is just a street yes. network? Uh, it's the subway uh, network. Doesn't come, but how do you associate subway with this? Uh, with, uh, uh, <laughs> um, good question. Uh, let me find out. <laughs> um, do, do you know, Martin? Uh, isn't this... it the, the commuting network? Yeah, is it though? Uh, this one was uh, created by my well, co-author. Uh, let me get back to you. I will. I will look at the figure again. But meanwhile, uh, we, as I hinted to, we can also look at real value absorption probability. When when they, we don't have categories, we might have some some real value, and we can use. Uh, any decreasing function for this, but we have used this expression. Um, uh, so we look at uh, uh, a decreasing exponential in the difference, the absolute difference of the metadata values. Uh, so we applied this to the European power grid uh, where we use uh, node prices as the metadata. Uh, so here we just have the, the node prices in Euro uh, and here we have uh, three results for increasingly strong uh, metadata influence. And here we can actually see some, some non-local relations. Uh, this uh, sheep area here uh, intersects the rich, uh, uh, richer area in southern, uh, southern France from the nord northwestern one. And what um, is metadata here? Is it, is it income? No, it's node prices. Uh, how much do you have to pay? What's, what's the ask for uh, electricity in, at that mm -hmm. uh, power grid node? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, so uh, to summarize, uh, we can model different absorption behaviors, uh, different relations. They can be assortative, neutral, or dissortative. We can use different kinds of metadata. I didn't go into vectorial data, but if you have uh, a distance function you can you can apply that to your to your data and we can look at non-local relations uh, yes thanks thank you yeah i think we uh, we move on uh chris Oh, yeah, we have, uh, okay, yes, no question. You're ready, Chris? No, I think so. So um, we switch 
gears a little bit. I'm going to talk about a centrality measure that we have derived from the map equation that is community aware. And uh, as Martin mentioned in the beginning, research is not always a straight line. We're trying to solve one problem. And in the process of trying to do that, we come up with something else. So our co-author, Juan Carlos, he is working with knowledge representation and reasoning. And um, we were looking for ways of how could we make a connection between argumentation frameworks and artificial intelligence and our map equation work. And in the process of doing that, we kind of sort of accidentally came up with a centrality measure. <laughs> so the question with centrality is, okay, we have a network and we want to figure out which are the most influential nodes. And here, for example, which of the nodes four or five is more influential? If you take simple measures like degree centrality, so you say that a node is more important if it has more links, then you would say nodes four and five should be equally important. Of course, there are measures that can deal with this and say whether node four or five is more important or not, but um, you can also construct examples where those measures get problems. And the typically, um, the typical approach that is usually taken traditionally is to take a local point of view and look at what are the features of the nodes or take a global point of view from an overall global structural perspective of the network. And um, we go in between here. We're using communities to determine the influence of nodes. Um, we have already heard about how the map equation works. So we have a network where a random walk is taking place and we would like to describe the random walk. And we can find an efficient coding scheme for doing that by dividing the network into modules. Um, the map equation is actually an analytical expression down here. Essentially, um, it, it corresponds to hierarchical entropy. So we have a system of systems and it says that, well, we have the transitions between the modules, which is this part and uh, described by these code words here. And there's a certain entropy to those. And then we have certain amounts of time that the random walker spends in the different modules. And these modules also have an internal entropy. So, and um, the map equation says, okay, the average number of bits that we need to use to describe one step of the random walker is given by this hierarchical entropy. Okay, um, we're using an idea that comes from the concept of network vitality. Network vitality is the following thing. Uh, imagine you have a graph and you have a function f that operates on graphs, then the vitality with respect to some node is defined in the following way. We use our function f and see what value does it return on the graph. We use our function f to see what value does it return on the graph if we remove this node u we're interested in. And the difference between is the vitality of that node in the graph. <clears throat> so this idea was used to define modularity vitality. So based on the modularity, um, measure, you say, okay, I look at a graph and I want to know how important is a certain node u. Okay, I delete it and I see how much does the, vitality, uh, the, the modularity for my partition that I have changed. Here we're taking a slightly different approach because the problem with this is if you delete a node, you potentially change the community structure of the network. We want to avoid that and we're using our coding approach to do that. So we do not remove the nodes. Instead, we keep them there, which means the visit rates of the random walk and modules stay unchanged. Instead, what we're doing is what we call silencing the node, meaning that when the random walker gets to that node, we ignore it. We don't encode this transition. But what that means is that the per step description length of the random walk changes because we now have a node that we don't describe anymore. And the general idea is that if we are silencing a more important node, then we should see a larger change in the per step code length. 
So silencing nodes, how does this work? Um, first, let's just take this example network. This is our starting point. Nothing has happened yet, but we have two communities here, the blue and orange ones. We have an example uh, a section of a random walk. The code length for this, for describing this, uh, this part of a random walk, and down here, the code words that we would use to describe this. And um, for all those things that we're talking about, keep in mind that we are not actually simulating random walks. We're looking at the distribution of visit rates and we are considering it from a information theoretic perspective. And we're also not actually assigning code words. This is only a useful illustration to think about what's going on. Okay, now about silencing nodes, we can use the same code that we had before. So the one that was shown here with the code words next to the nodes, but simply not encode the transition to the silenced node. So let's say we're silencing this node and we're never going to use this code word down here. We can see then that the per step, or the, the average code length had, has reduced. And also we use fewer bits to describe this section of the random walk because we're not describing the visit to this node anymore. And, but we're still describing when we're entering or exiting a module through this node. We can then take the map equation and rewrite it. We can split between uh, what codes we're using at the index level, the bits we're spending in modules that do not contain the node we're interested in, and the module that contains the node we're interested in. Okay, but this is inefficient. We now, we have a code word here we're never using, and if we would remove this, we could assign shorter code words to the rest of the nodes in the same module. So that is the second option of how we can do it. We're silencing this node and design a new coding scheme. So this node does not receive a code word at all. And these nodes receive shorter code words. And we can also express that in forms of an updated map equation. How much will we pay in bits per step of the random walker using this coding scheme? And again, we can split between the index level modules that do not contain this node we're interested in and the module that contains this node we're interested in. Now comes in the idea of network vitality. We're looking at the difference between these two. And we see that, well, index level, nothing has changed. Modules without this node we're interested in, they are the same. Only in the module where we have silenced a node, there we have a different expression. And uh, so the difference between these two is then this expression down here, uh, which yes, I have here again. So we say that map equation centrality on a given graph with a given partition for a certain node u is defined like this. And here, this PMU is the, the flow that this module M has where the node u is in, and PU is the flow that this node we're interested in has. So the importance of the influence of a node is determined by its own visit rate and the amount of flow that is within this module. And um, well, we can interpret it in the following way. Map equation centrality captures the harm that a node causes to others by its existence. But what does it mean? Well, if this node wasn't there and if we wouldn't assign a code word for it, then the other nodes could have shorter code words. So in that sense, this node is causing a harm to the other nodes and forcing them to have longer code words. And uh, this only affects nodes within the same module because the, the coding schemes we have, the conceptual coding schemes, uh, they are per module. And an advantage of this is that map equation centrality is true to the map equation. It is not defined in an ad hoc way, but map equation centrality and the map equation, they share the same understanding of what a community is. And uh, well, looking at our example from the beginning again, map equation centrality says that node four is more important than node five. In this case, because there's more flow 
in the blue module than in the orange module. And this increased amount of flow gives more importance to this node. Um, we have evaluated our centrality measure on some real world networks using two different kinds of spreading processes. The first of them is an SIR disease spreading model where we use an SIR simulation to determine the influence for each node U. And the influence there is its spreading power. That means the expected number of infected nodes if we start an SIR disease from node U alone. And we have also tested in the so-called linear threshold model where the influence of a set of nodes is their activation size. So you can think about it as um, uh, the adoption of ideas. You, you have a few nodes that adopt an idea and they try to convince their neighbors. But every node says, I will only also adopt this idea and believe you if at least half of my neighbors believe this. Mm -hmm. So you select a few uh, starting nodes that believe in your idea and you see how many nodes in the network can they activate and also convince of this idea. And um, then we check how is the activation size in such a cascade. Uh, we have used two different flow models. This is the nice thing about map equation centrality because it's built on the map equation where you can use different kinds of dynamics. You can use, uh, for example, recorded node teleportation corresponding to page rank, or you can use something called unrecorded link teleportation where you're teleporting to links instead of to nodes. And we have compared with three community aware baselines. And what we see is for the SIR case that um, here in blue, we have map equation centrality. The solid line corresponds to when we are using unrecorded link teleportation. And we see that in this case, unrecorded link teleportation works quite well and does best in some of the networks. The dashed lines correspond to when we're using recorded node teleportation. So when our flow model is the same as in standard page rank with 15% teleportation probability. And we see that um, when we base our measure on page rank, we don't do as well. Uh, for the other measures, there's also a difference between using communities based on the unrecorded link teleportation and the recorded node teleportation. Um, but we find that in general, the effect on the other measures is not as strong as it is for map equation centrality. And then in the linear threshold model, we see actually that um, when we use the page rank based flow model, then we do better. And um, we can explain it with that, uh, that in, in this linear threshold model, to have a cascade that reaches the whole network, we need to have some nodes that we select in all the different modules, because otherwise it's difficult to convince people in those modules to adopt a new idea. And um, standard page rank distributes some part of the flow uniformly. So uh, nodes have a certain minimum amount. And um, actually, how nodes are spread out across modules in the case when we use um, unrecorded link teleportation, nodes are more focused into small numbers of modules. But when we're using recorded node teleportation, nodes are spread more out uniformly across modules. And for those different spreading processes, different things work differently well. Uh, so with our choice of flow model, we can influence or we, we, can, we can match which kind of spreading process we can characterize better and um, select the, the most influential nodes according to that spreading process. And uh, to conclude, we have considered node centrality from a community-based perspective. And we propose map equation centrality, which is a flow-based centrality approach that is analytically derived from the map equation. And uh, what we find is that map equation centrality forms, performs well in determining influential nodes in the real world, in real world networks when using the right flow model. And if you have a different um, spreading process, 
you want to characterize, you can choose your own flow model and uh, also use InfoMap to find those communities and determine the central nodes, the most influential nodes based on your own flow model. And uh, thanks for your attention. We have a preprint on archive, which is slightly outdated because since we have uploaded it, we have added uh, this analysis with the linear threshold model and some more explanation of why things are the way they are with map equation centrality. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, just make one observation. We have. Um, 32 minutes of scheduled talks in front of us and uh, 26 minutes in the uh, remaining time. Uh, so I think we should just continue with the talks and then like postpone discussion uh, either voluntarily later on or uh, for later because uh, I would like to really give everybody the voice um, and I'm very sorry that we discussed too much. I think we also uh, underestimated the, the time <laughs> of our talk. <laughs> so it's... Uh... I think um, Daniel and Jelena, you can uh, present the core of uh, maybe you know where you can cut it a bit. Um. Uh, I will share the screen. Yes. We're too excited, I'm sorry. Uh, I will talk about uh, community detection in um, weighted and directed networks uh, where we have incomplete uh, observations. Uh, so we are interested in uh, flow-based communities. We define flow-based uh, community as a group of nodes where flow persists for a relatively long time. And uh, map equation is used uh, to find uh, those communities. And um, it works well, it's efficient and detects uh, community accurately if we have a uh, complete uh, data. Uh, and uh, I'm going to discuss what happens if we have uh, incomplete data. So we have uh, some complex system and uh, data that are provided can uh, contain measurement error or some other errors. So when we uh, construct network, uh, network uh, um, can have uncertain uh, structure uh, so if we model a flow on uh, the on network like that, uh, then uh, transition rates uh, can be inaccurate. And as a result, uh, map equation can uh, detect insignificant uh, community structure. Uh, here is an example that illustrates what's happened. Uh, we have a network with uh, seven nodes and uh, li links uh, are weighted. Um, and we assume that this is a complete network. Uh, when we use map equation, it uh, finds two communities. Uh, but uh, if we have uh, missing observations, so uh, here instead uh, to have a link weight two, we have a link weight one, and we have uh, uh, four uh, such inaccurate uh, links. Uh, then uh, when we use map equation, it detects uh, three communities. And so uh, it overfits, it finds uh, more uh, smaller communities. Um, here uh, we show what happens when we have a bigger network that has a thousand nodes and uh, a 31 community. So uh, network is weighted and we treat it as a multigraph uh, and then we remove uh, multi edges randomly. Uh, so uh, if we move less than 60% of multi edges, uh, map equation detects uh, 31 communities, but then uh, it starts detect detecting more and more communities. Uh, so to prevent uh, these things to happen, uh, we should uh, regularize the map equation. Um, and I will uh, present uh, our solution. Uh, so first we address this problem for uh, unweighted and undirected networks. Uh, there we uh, made the prior assumption about uh, transition rates, uh, then estimated the posterior uh, uh, flow distribution, and then uh, integrate map equation for um, using those posterior probabilities and we obtained the closed form formula for the map equation uh, that we uh, implemented in InfoMap and uh, that was um, uh, efficient. Um, efficiency is the same as for the standard map equation. Uh, but unfortunately we cannot use this approach for uh, direct networks uh, because there we don't have an analytical formula for uh, uh, transition rates. Um, then we looked at what uh, uh, 
uh, this uh, posterior estimate uh, does on a standard map equation, and we notice that uh, effect is similar as uh, teleportation. Uh, we uh, have teleportation in direct networks uh, uh, to address problem with ergodicity. If we have uh, groups of nodes uh, where we don't have outgoing or incoming links, then a random walker uh, cannot reach those nodes or cannot uh, exit those nodes. And then we use mathematical tricks. Uh, we allow random walker to teleport uh, to uh, any other node in the network with some um, small probability and in practice we use 15% uh, uh, teleportation probability. Uh, here uh, teleportation is illustrated with a light blue color. Uh, so um, here we have light blue circles and, uh, and they represent probability that random walker teleports to any node in the network. Uh, so uh, with 85% uh, random walker uh, will uh, follow links in original network. Uh, this uh, standard teleportation cannot uh, prevent uh, overfitting. Again, we will get uh, three communities and we can try to increase uh, uh, teleportation uh, probability, but it will not help. But then uh, randomness will dominate and, uh, and net network, uh, we will lose the signal in network structure. So then we have problem with underfitting. Uh, instead, we modify uh, teleportation using the weighted uh, network prior. Um, so uh, idea is uh, to create a network that run walker will uh, follow when it uh, teleports. And um, there we use a continuous uh, configuration model that uh, has been proposed for weighted networks to model uh, link weights. Uh, so it's empirical uh, prior where we use the information about the node strength. The node strength is the sum of uh, link weights incident to that node and we have a node degree. Uh, and uh, here we also have connectivity parameter. Uh, that's our assumption that uh, nodes I and J are connected. And in the simplest case, we assume that uh, this uh, probability is uh, constant uh, and it's a logarithm n over n. Um, we choose this value because it's uh, a transition probability where a random network goes from a disconnected to connect phase. So it's uh, strong enough to prevent overfitting. Uh, but also allows uh, detecting uh, communities if there is a good signal in the network. Um, we can, uh, uh, this uh, approach is flexible, so we can uh, incorporate more uh, information. For example, if we have a bipartite network, then uh, assumption that uh, node, any two nodes uh, can be connected is wrong. Uh, instead, we allow only uh, nodes I and J that are in different groups uh, being connected, and uh, they're connected with a probability where a uh, random bipartite network uh, gets connected. Uh, if we have a uh, information about the node labels uh, provided, then we can uh, use that information as well. So um, uh, nodes I and J and that uh, have same uh, metadata label M are connected with higher probability and that probability is proportional to number of nodes that uh, uh, share that uh, metadata label. And uh, we incorporated uh, this uh, uh, corrected uh, map equation into InfoMap and uh, it recovers uh, uh, the same communities that we see in uh, original network. Uh, so this approach can uh, reduce overfitting and uh, we have in, uh, efficient implementation in InfoMap. Uh, we don't create a fully connected uh, network. Instead, we uh, just uh, correct the transition rates. So its efficiency is uh, almost the same as for the standard map equation. Uh, and uh, I, I will show a few examples. Uh, first, uh, here is a synthetic network that uh, has a thousand nodes, uh, average degree seven, and the mixing parameter is 0 0.4. Um, network has 31 uh, communities. Uh, and um, we see uh, that uh, when um, number of missing observation is high, then uh, map equation overfits. Uh, but uh, this uh, regularized version uh, with weighted network prior uh, detects uh, no community structure if there is no good signal in the data. Uh, I will skip this. Uh, so here we have one uh, real world uh, network. It's a network uh, that model interactions between female and male students in uh, one high school. And the network is bipartite. So here we will use a bipartite uh, prior. Uh, and the students are assigned uh, to one of uh, nine classes. And we use that information as metadata. So we see a similar trend, the standard map equation overfits. Uh, 
uh, while uh, this uh, weighted network prior uh, detects uh, no communities uh, if uh, data are too sparse. In this case, we have um, metadata that are correlated with uh, community structure. So um, if we uh, have a metadata information, then uh, we always recover night communities. Uh, here is network where we uh, don't have so good uh, quality of metadata. It's a network of airports located uh, outside of US. Uh, they are located um, into 97 countries and we use that information uh, as metadata. And we see that uh, network structure is very sensitive. So uh, even if we remove a small fraction of observations, uh, map equation uh, detects uh, more and more communities. Uh, if we use um, weighted network priors, then um, if we remove more than 50% uh, observations, uh, it cannot find uh, any community structure. Uh, while uh, for metadata, we get uh, 35 uh, communities and uh, uh, that number differs uh, then uh, for other two approaches. Uh, and uh, then when we remove more than 80% uh, of observations, it detects uh, no communities. So uh, quality of approach, if you use metadata, depends on um, how well uh, metadata are correlated with uh, uh, community structure. And we are also interested in the quality of uh, communities. Uh, we can uh, test it using a synthetic network where we have information about uh, um, ground, we, we have ground truth, we know how communities should look like. Um, and um, we look at adjust mutual information that measures similarity. If it's one, then we recover uh, planted uh, communities. Um, so uh, we see that uh, uh, when we have uh, enough data, both uh, standard map equation and uh, a regularized version um, work well. And then when uh, quality of uh, uh, partition uh, decreases, uh, then uh, regularized version uh, detects uh, no community structure. And uh, I would like uh, to conclude here with message that uh, if we have a network where we are not sure if uh, data are complete, uh, in that case, we should use uh, this regularized version that can prevent overfitting, even if we have a uh, 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 substantial fraction of uh, missing data. And uh, we have a paper published in the Journal of Complex Networks. So there we have more information about, uh, uh, about the model and uh, we have more results there. And uh, I would like to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, super fascinating. Yeah, so uh, while uh, Daniel sets up, uh, now we're covering a lot of ground in four time, <laughs> but um, what I did uh, first was to present like this multidisciplinary approach we take in Islab, and uh, also that we, what was something I started during my postdoc with this map equation framework to simplify networks, which I thought was the last thing I would do in network science. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was lucky that it turned out to be something that worked and uh, we could generalize. And, and what you have seen is a number of generalizations. So um, Anton showed how you could modify the random walker to learn new things about your complex system. And uh, Chris showed how you could use uh, the community that you find for other things uh, you didn't think about before, like centrality measures. Um, and Yelena, talked about like, yeah, the problem we are always facing with, with missing data and coming back to this teleportation that uh, you, Mike, asked about in the very beginning, like, why, why do you do it in this particular way? And that's always been a, a problem for us, like why, why this uh, probability? But it was nice to derive uh, a, a teleportation scheme from basic principles of um, statistics. So now uh, Daniel will finish. It's like what happens if you start collaborating with researchers in another discipline and you do that for a long time and then you find a community who want to use your tools 
and so you um, um, improve them uh, iteratively. And uh, so now he's working on uh, the second version of what he calls the bioregions, implement bioregions. Uh, yes. Uh, so there's a button uh, in the presenter mode awesome. somewhere. Um, maybe that. I think it's easier if. Oh, yeah, it's, it's working. Now it works fine. Now we see what you want us to see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see the notes, but I, I can skip it. So yeah, I will uh, hide the floating controls. Um, yeah, present infinite by readiness to uh, mapping by bi uh, geographic signal of diversification events from species occurrences and relations. So quickly some background on the first version. Um, by regions uh, maps the organization of species. Uh, the input to data is uh, simply a list of um, species and where they occur, and we bin them into grid cells. And we can use adaptive uh, resolution uh, to follow the uh, resolution of the data by subdividing grid cells. Uh, and this creates a bipartite network that we can partition with the InfoMap. Uh, to find these uh, modules of grid cells and species. And the grid cells in the same module uh, is what makes up a bioregion. And then we can export uh, that in different ways. So there uh, are some limitations of uh, doing this without the tree that we have. And one is that we, we treat uh, all species as equally distinct. We disregard important knowledge for effective biodiversity conservation. Uh, for example, we, we, we have no knowledge about the uh, real or phylogenetic diversity within each uh, grid cell or by region. And arbitrariness in taxonomic classification affects the result. For example, E and F, someone would uh, maybe treat them as a single species and then they would be uh, same as one by region, and uh, now there are two. So uh, the by region may get fragmented of, with sparse data. So, how can we integrate the tree into the network? Um, yeah, oh, sorry, it goes automatically. The by regions are, uh, yeah, and more fundamentally, by regions are dynamical entities with an evolutionary history. And uh, that evolutionary history also explains partly the the current pattern. So we want to incorporate in some way. And our uh, solution is to um, uh, use uh, a certain time that we call integration time that um, the user can select to inform the network with the relatedness of the species at that time. So for example, when we increase it, uh, a step here, then species E and F are uh, basically the same population. They before they have diversified, uh, diversified, uh, yeah, diversified, and then you get the same. Um, the, these two grid cells in the bottom merge to a single by region. Uh, and when the integration time crosses a branch, we interpolate between the parent and child. Uh, and then we can uh, uh, move it back uh, in time and uh, also set increase the set the relative tree strength to say how much uh, the tree should matter. So now we find, for example, the, the bottom by region, the green one, the corresponds to the spatial distribution of the N5 clade. But what if uh, sub clades or sub trees uh, overlap in space, uh, like the uh, N4 and N2, um, these two branches, they overlap on the second top grid cell. And that uh, collapses the, the bioregion 
uh, patterns. So we, we have a way to do that with higher order networks uh, where we can segregate on um, uh, branches by using memory nodes. So if we have this flow perspective, uh, we can remember which branch we, uh, we come from. So let's say we go from uh, species C to uh, the grid cell uh, in which it, which it occur uh, by using the N3 as memory, then we are restricted to go back to the clade defined by that memory. Uh, so we keep the flow segregated on the evolutionary branches at the selected time. And by the higher order network, which is uh, these state nodes within physical nodes, uh, we have as a result overlapping by regions uh, in space. And then we can keep uh, the spatial distribution. We can find interpolate between the uh, spatial distribution of the tree at different times uh, without collapsing um, regions where the evolutionary history overlap or mixes. So, Yes, then on some uh, empirical data, we have uh, in tropical mammals, we can do a, a parameter sweep of, of the integration time and uh, map the, the biogeographic signal uh, in the tree at the time uh, to find um, regions where we interpolate between uh, clades that have uh, isolated uh, spatial extent. For example, usually islands uh, and maybe mountain regions. Uh, yeah, uh, and we can find the times where where the bioregional patterns changes, uh, typically diversification events. And then with the segregation time. We keep the main branches here segregated, and then we can find uh, more of the pattern uh, where the species overlap uh, in the tree um, within these regions, uh, and uh, still find uh, distinct ones. So, yeah, I. I uh, uh, stop here. <laughs> um, so, um, yes, so we have two minutes left. I'm very tempted to ask the question how this relates to in this uh, um, um, perceived by the classic species distribution literature, which is very metadata based, weather, altitude, and whatever. But I, I hold back, but I will send you an email. Um, there is one question which I think we can take, which is Tasvir, who had his hands up since the last talk. Yeah, uh, thank you for these nice talks and all the discussion. Uh, I have one question that uh, uh, I threw out your uh, uh, discussion and the talk. Most of your work, it was uh, describing based on the random walks and uh, uh, random walks and a related, a very closely related topic to this is uh, that is using the deep walk that is based on the <clears throat> uh, graph convolution neural networks, and uh, it it incorporates the applying the concept graph representation using deep learning as a as a as a deep walk. If I am not wrong, uh, have I, uh, the paper has been? I can uh, don't exactly remember the, the the title of the paper, but it, I have read it many times, and it was published by two thousand seventeen or eighteen. So I want to see that have you explored the deep walk methods uh, in your work or, or 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 any idea about that or, or this kind of this just a question. So, so when I'm preparing for this uh, lab meeting, uh, Chris decided between two different uh, projects. Uh, one about um, using the math equation for for um, graph representation learning. So maybe Chris, you want to say. Uh, Spend 30 seconds on on uh, what you learned there. Or I can feel uh, basically we, we are exploring uh, 
uh, no to VEC and uh, mm. deep walk. Yeah, no to VEC and deep walk. Learning. Um, and uh, because they also explore the network uh, with random walks or with biased random walks. Yeah. Uh, uh, but we we wanted to like. It was a, there was an also sorry, sorry to interrupt. There was an also paper structure to VEC. Node to VEC and structure to VEC. It was also a, a paper on, on this in this this kind of, of work. No. So, so long story short, this is also a topic we should shortcut. <laughs> yes. Yeah, much. but basically we, we we have a paper on that uh, submitted to uh, KDD, and so that that some maybe we could uh, continue that discussion. Yes. So uh, I'd like to uh, like add a summary comment. So this was fascinating to see uh, from sort of like the basic academic mixing that you do uh, to uh, basically really really detailed uh, applications and this really long sort of success story of the whole map equation and InfoMap uh, story, which still continues with high order networks, which uh, we didn't have time to talk about. Um, and I think this is, this is really something like how you built this lab is a really interesting thing uh, to, to actually have an eye on as we, what we do here is multidisciplinary uh, cultural data analytics. But at the same time, there is like plenty of different uh, approaches where we could sort of like align and sort of like, for example, add the word cultural to, you had this like sentence where you had structure function dynamics, and then you had like the topics. And there, there was the classic thing, technological, social, biological, there was the word cultural missing as usual. Um, so this is something which is sort of um, at least my goal uh, to make this happen. Uh, it took us six years to make it happen in SI. Um, and I would love to sort of like make it happen more. Um, one of the uh, things that we should tell to the audience who may come from the humanities, may think, oh, that was mathy, um, and that maybe don't know what, what to do with all that. So there may be these moments, like I certainly, coming from art history, walking into something like that, there may be these moments when you see in this kind of talks, oh, that is like all of a sudden I get that. I didn't get the last five minutes, but I, I, I get this particular notion now, this kind of result, this map, this kind of uh, uh, plot. And so it's important to keep these kind of moments in mind because there may be a moment when in your own research, you actually sort of arrive at a moment where you say, oh, I know somebody who actually worked on this. And then you basically have to write phone number slash paper to cite and people to walk up to where you say, I got this data, I got this phenomenon, can you help me with this method? And so you, you really set like an example uh, by doing this not only in a sense that uh, basically you do this on a, on a, on a collaborative um, sort of like a direct let's collaborate together kind of version, but by producing these websites um, this is really also something to, to look after and basically do with all the stuff we're doing. Let's create these kind of like easy on ramps for people. I think that is really, really cool. So uh, I thank you very much for giving us this glimpse into what IceLab is doing. And I hope this uh, is um, the start of a journey where uh, maybe we find different ways how to work together. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I just showing this uh, Sarah and Peter slide. So we are Sarah and you are Peter, or the other way around. And now you have seen a glimpse of some of our tools. And uh, as you say, Max, maybe you have seen that. Oh, this I have this problem, and uh, maybe this method can uh, work to reach my my goals. So please reach out, contact us. We I mean we are living for these interactions. Uh, we. We wouldn't do what we are doing if we didn't have these meetings and one of you contacted us and uh, opened a new avenue of research and uh, getting into the cultural stuff would be wonderful. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you very much.